Yes. Okay. Yeah. So let me get started. Uh, I'm uh, very grateful for the organizers to invite me to this event. Uh, the title is the Race for Better Batteries, but I want to emphasize that uh, uh, building better batteries is a global effort. It's not a race among the countries or the continents. Uh, it's actually humanity's race against the rising temperature and the CO2 levels. Uh, the reason I say that is because 10 years down the road, we will have more than 8.5 billion people living on the planet Earth. We have 6 billion smartphones and tablets all powered by batteries, and we have about 1 billion cars to be electrified. So there's a gazillion number of batteries that needs to be made by humanity, and it's really, really important that we have a global cooperations for making better batteries so the humanity can win the race for uh, bending the CO2 curve. So let me uh, give a very quick introduction of the brief history of batteries. Uh, I think it's important to realize that uh, uh, we, the human race, actually have been dreaming about bottling the lightning uh, since 1748, when Benjamin Franklin first coined the word battery. Along the 270 years, uh, when Sir Volta uh, built the Volta pile, when the French scientist discovered the uh, uh, chemistry for lead acid battery, until 1960s, uh, Olszewski uh, discovered the nickel metal hydride batteries. I want to emphasize that every time when we discovered a new battery chemistries, we make better batteries, we never replace the old ones. If you remember, the more than half of the volume of the batteries is still run by the lead acid batteries today. We only open up new emerging applications. We use batteries to improve the quality of life. And this is a really important lesson for me because uh, think back in history that 1976 and 1980, when Professor Whittingham and the Professor Goodenough uh, built the first generation uh, lithium ion batteries that's based on intercalation chemistry, which had them earn the Nobel chemistry two years ago. Uh, it's really important to realize that uh, the discovery or the commercialization of the lithium ion chemistry based on intercalation enabled the revolution of mobile devices and electric cars. And for the young generation of scientists and researchers like myself, we need to constantly question ourselves what else we are building to better the quality of life. So the answer is quite clear because now we have the uh, Internet of Things, the robots, the flying cars, the drones, and more importantly, we would like to build a reliable deployment of renewables like solar and wind, and we need energy storage for renewables. So uh, when we set up the right motivations, then we understand why we need to go beyond intercalation. So let me first say intercalation chemistry definitely changed the picture of people about the battery is just a black box where you have the positive and the negative uh, signage. In fact, uh, intercalation chemistry, this battery has provided the material scientists and engineers a beautiful platform to study materials chemistry and electrochemistry. So give you an example, when I shine the X-ray on a functional intercalation battery, uh, if you shine the X-ray on the cathode, which is typically transition metal oxide, you can actually watch how the volume changes when the lithium gets intercalated in and out of the structure. And you can observe in some cases, there will be a phase transformation that can be captured by this kind of operandal characterization and this phase transformation is actually completely reversible when you discharge the battery. Okay, so to make a rechargeable battery that has very, very long cycle life, it is of vital importance to people to understand those important concepts that we are moving atoms, we are moving matters. So there are chemical bond breaking and the formation. So lithium goes out and comes into the anode. And during this dynamic phenomena, one has to realize even for intercalation chemistry, there are a few percentage of volume changes happening. And 
think about your batteries has to go through a thousand or three thousand times of those volume changes a good analogy is to compare the batteries to an airplane that has to take off and the landing because the atmosphere pressure and high attitude pressure difference so the materials goes through there's a string events where we'll eventually experience fatigue and you will develop defects and that's how eventually the battery material starts to fail or start to degradate the other very important concept in the electrochemistry we must realize when you build this battery with the anode cathode immersed in the electrolyte the protective passivating layer SEI is so important because when you put the batteries at open circuit voltage open circuit when you're not using it the energy retained in the batteries must be stable so this concept of solid electrolyte interface has been a long-standing challenges for our field and as we're moving away from intercalation chemistry for example the carbon you know is a layered structure this carbon is going to be replaced by silicon or lithium metal these are not intercalation materials anymore so how can you ensure the electrolyte is still compatible with the new types of anode or cathode materials is a really really big question because unlike fuel cells my battery the battery is a thermodynamically closed system every carrier you have is actually inside of this cell phone batteries that you have you look at your cell phone batteries no matters will flow in and flow out of the system so it's a thermodynamically closed system and that makes the material science and engineering job extremely difficult because each level from atom atomic level to primary particle level to secondary particle level to system level electrode everything must be perfect because if you have any inefficiency that cause the loss of lithium even one percent can cause very detrimental effect on your battery's cycle life and this graph very simply show the importance of columbic efficiencies when we have a battery that can last for a thousand cycles the efficiency the um, lithium shuttling between the cathode and anode are highly efficient so if we are building characterization techniques and trying to decipher where is the degradation happen this job is very difficult because the change is indeed very very subtle we're trying to detect less than 0.1 percent of the degradation uh, phenomena so a good example to show you is you know my work uh, uh, this is almost 10 years ago i mean it's exactly 10 years ago but at that time we were thinking about how can we utilize atomic resolution you know scanning transmission electron microscope i mean 10 years ago it's not very common for people to use this kind of so-called very fancy tools to look at the surface of a high voltage cathode materials and before and after you know here you're seeing very beautifully synthesized the cathode particles where you have layered structure we are calling it a layered structure by cartoon and actually you can observe in the microscope and the change is very subtle after high voltage exposures you actually see the lithium condition metals they swapping their positions but the major phase changes only on the surface two nanometers right and this phenomena can be easily missing in the traditional diffraction based techniques but with this kind of new fancy tools we can then detect the uh, structural and the chemical change on the high voltage cathode materials and it's since then the entire battery field we always know the cathode particle surface have to be protected with some kind of very robust coating so that the battery can operate a long time on the high voltage so um this is good lesson for like you know I think for this audience I can say this uh so we have developed many uh quantitative high-end scientific tools to help us to understand from atom to system where are all the phenomena dynamic phenomena happening which ones are reversible which one are not reversible 
So the few examples I'm going to show you today really shows you the importance of the sensitivity and the accuracy of these tools because the interface is really the key to control when you put electrode, electrolyte together. And even inactive materials like binder additives play a very important role. And in an electrochemical system, I hope I demonstrated to you their chemistry, there's electrical engineer, there's mechanical engineering issues, and eventually I will also show you their thermal management issues if we want to move beyond intercalation chemistry uh, to the um, uh, lithium metal cells or solid state batteries. So um, lithium metal battery is not new at all, right? So why uh, 40, 50 years later, our, our generation of scientists think we can uh, tackle the problem again. So I think uh, there's a few important things we should realize. The first one is really the power of computation. So this comes from my uh, PhD advisor, former advisor, Professor Cedar's early um, um, MRS metal talk. Uh, you know, he basically grouped all the known materials to humanity at that time uh, to the capacity versus voltage for the lithium ion uh, uh, system. So just with this simple graph, uh, when I started my tenure track, I know very clearly these are the areas I will be focusing on uh, because this is the region where you can achieve very high capacity and a very uh, suitable voltage for the existing electrolytes. So this is one of the key enabling factors, in my opinion, computation and the power of supercomputers can save us quite a few years uh, to actually think about the uh, next generation materials. So on the lithium ion battery side, the next generation materials, in my opinion, are these uh, anion redox oxides, where you can have 30 to 40% energy density increase compared to the classical layered oxide. But just the uh, battery performance itself is not interesting, right? What interests the scientists is what are the new signs that enable us to store more lithium, store more energy in the matter, right? So this is where um, we utilize the state-of-art coherent X-ray diffraction because the coherent X-ray diffraction can enable us to detect the string during intercalation and to detect the defects such as dislocation and uh, uh, you know, screw dislocation or edge dislocation generated during the electrochemical operation. So the classical materials and the new anion redox materials has completely different tolerance to the defects. And the defects is, you know, for material scientists, the defect is good defects or bad defects. So if you have the defect density uh, actually engineered correctly in the particle, the particle can actually indeed store more lithium and um, actually release more lithium reversibly and uh, give you more energy density. So this kind of breakthrough in the energy density for the cathode materials is so exciting for us. I mean, there was a, a widely criticized that this material has a voltage fading problem. But right now, I think this voltage problem is completely under control because we now understand defect play a very important role in the, ro in the uh, defect, in the voltage decay. By controlling the defect density, we can actually control uh, the voltage decay and we can predict the voltage decay. So um, if I show you the roadmap of what's going on for intercalation chemistry, even though the Nobel Prize is already given, I think it's really nice to think about what did our field do in the last 20 plus years, right? Uh, because we didn't change, I mean, we stayed with intercalation chemistry, we changed the cathode materials, right? Just by using the graphite anode, we were able to triple the energy density and thanks to the, you know, the economy of skills, particularly the contributions from Asian countries, the cost has reduced more than 10 times since the time I have graduated. I mean, when I graduated, the lithium ion battery pack cost is $2,000 per kilowatt hour. I would never imagine that, you know, 15 years later, it's less than $150 per kilowatt hour. And I think the solar field is seeing the same trend. Uh, you know, it's truly, truly exciting. Um, and uh, I think if you look at this roadmap that's established by U.S. Uh, Argonne National Lab, I think it's very good to have a roadmap and think about 
what we need to do to enable the next big jump in energy density. So if you look at the energy per weight and the energy per volume, let's not argue about the exact numbers, whether they are on the cell level or system level. The important thing is the ranking, right? So what's being commercialized and what are in the pocket of scientists? Because we have demonstrated that the lithium metal pair with the NI redox materials can give you very high volumetric energy density batteries. And if we pair lithium metal with the oxygen or sulfur based cathode, we can really, really take off in the uh, gravimetric energy density. These kind of batteries are very, very good for flying cars like drones, right? So those roadmap tells us very clear message, lithium metal anode must be enabled. So that led to our 2016 a consortium based research that's led by Dr. Jin Liu from Pacific Northwestern National Lab and included uh, both Professor Whittingham and Professor Goodenough in our consortium. So if you look at the lithium metal batteries, again, you know, for young scientists, please read the 1976 science paper. I think I love those kind of publications that 50 years ago, everything in that paper is still correct. So in the 1970s, when Professor Whittingham built the first lithium metal batteries, the cathode has no lithium in it. It's titanium disulfide. So for this reason, he needs to put a very thick block of lithium metal on the negative electrode side. Our situation is completely different. We have high lithium containing lithium cobalt oxide, lithium iron phosphate, or lithium nickel magnesium cobalt oxide. So today, when we build the third generation, so I call the third generation or second generation lithium metal cells, uh, you can actually see that we can afford to put a very thin layer of lithium metal because the new electrolyte discovered by Pacific Northwest National Lab enable us to deposit and strip lithium with very high efficiency. So in theory, you can have anode free. But of course, you know, anode free is has other problems, um, you know, but I will just say like we just need ultra ultra thin lithium metal because most of the lithium will be contained in the NMC side. So if you use sulfur, you still have to use thick lithium metal. I won't touch this topic today because um, the focus will be on the lithium metal. So again, let me brought back to my major message is okay. So why in the early days, lithium metal um, characterization is so difficult. So I show you an example. Literally, lithium reacts with everything. When I say everything, it means nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, lithium reacts with everything. So when we do scientific instrument, even you use the focus ion beam to try to cut a fresh surface of lithium, the gallium ions actually alloys with lithium at room temperature. So if you do a room temperature cut of the lithium surface, everything you see here is artifacts. It's not the lithium surface that you're seeing. If you actually do cryogenic condition, the kinetics of the interaction will be dramatically reduced. And that's where you can actually get a quite clean surface of the lithium metal. Um, this lithium metal is of course a uh, you know, just a metal sheet. So it should supposed to be dense and very smooth and very nice looking. Now, why this tool is so important? Because electrochemically deposited lithium does have a lot of pores and torturosity. So if your tool already interfered with the lithium, you cannot observe lithium very well. That's a very easy logic to follow, right? So with this advanced tool, we can now cut lithium slice by slice in the fib and we can do three dimensional reconstruction of electrochemically deposited lithium. So in the electrolyte that the scientists have been optimizing for graphite anode carbonate electrolyte, we also call it the Gen2 electrolyte. It's terrible. The morphology is terrible. Okay. You can actually take the top view and the cross section view and you do the three dimensional cut it's really quite terrible. And the performance, I think the efficiency number is very low. So 98% means, you know, after a few 50 cycles, you have no capacity anymore. Everything is lost, right? The, the, 
when you have new electrolyte based on uh, you know what the Pacific Northwestern National Lab has reported uh, in the ether based electrolyte the morphology completely change. You have very dense lithium. I mean, it's not perfect yet. I will talk to you later about how to make it more perfectly dense, but these cells are um, actually reasonably much, much better than the carbonated electrolyte, right? So um, in order to understand why morphology is so important, uh, I want to show you this transmission TEM uh, picture and it's obtained under cryo condition. Uh, you cannot obtain this kind of uh, uh, very high resolution image in the regular TEM because these metallic lithium are actually surrounded by the insulating um, SEI. So SEI contains lithium oxide, lithium fluoride, lithium carbonate. It's very insulating. So when you put the high energy being electron being on it without the cryogenic condition, so it's not just the temperature, Cryo TEM also use very low dose and a very high detection efficiency uh, detectors. Right? So under those conditions, you can image lithium metal and you can actually see if you have large granular particles, you have very little lithium gets stuck in the SEI. But if you have those kind of torturous, very elongated, you know, uh, high aspect ratio lithium metal, it's very highly likely you will run into the situation where the lithium metal lost its structural connection with the current collector. So electrochemical, electrochemical, right? You need both the ion pathway and you need the electron pathway. So if the blue part SEI is too insulating, you cannot actually access the very good uh, electrochemical uh, system. So that's the reason in our uh, nature paper, we hypothesize that the SEI is not the major culprit for low efficiency lithium metal battery, but the microstructure control is. And to um, emphasize this important discovery, we also uh, complemented the TEM data with this new titration gas chromatography measurement. Uh, the principle is quite straightforward because of all the SEI component, uh, lithium metal is the one will give you hydrogen. So we only need to measure hydrogen amount. So when we measure the hydrogen amount, we found a very interesting phenomena that uh, agree with our hypothesis is that all the capacity loss is uh, perfectly correlated with the metallic part of the lithium, not with the SEI. So I want to emphasize here that, uh, you know, of course, some of these chromic efficiency numbers are so bad is because we deliberately chose electrolyte gave very bad columbic efficiency to prove the point. So when people now are working on the high efficiency electrolyte, I want to emphasize the SEI is still very important, right? So this work is already uh, two years ago to showcase that, you know, first we need to understand, we need to control the microstructure of the lithium metal. And the SEI is not the main reason for the low columbic efficiency of lithium metal batteries. So because of this discovery, uh, I think uh, uh, we can now think about other effective strategies to ensure the 100% reversibility of this um, lithium metal deposition and the stripping. So um, one of the most uh, uh, important or uh, successful example we have shown. So we worked a little bit on 3D current collector, I don't have time to go through today, but I will just show you that uh, with the pressure control, uh, right amount of pressure control, we can very successfully deposit, this bar is two micron, okay? So we are actually depositing 20 micron of dense lithium and strip this lithium uh, under a very moderate pressure level. And that all this knowledge has been translated into real uh, two amp hour cells that is uh, uh, made by Pacific Northwestern National Lab. This has been released to the public that, you know, in 2017, when we started, I told you we can barely cycle 50 cycles. And today, uh, Battery 500 is reporting more, more than 500 cycles for the uh, lithium metal cells. So again, I want to emphasize the battery performance is the consequences of doing the right material science. So in this case, I hope I showcase to you that lithium metal uh, anode is a very promising uh, uh, pathways forward.
So the second example I will give you is really anchoring towards, uh, you know, many young students coming to my group to study, uh, you know, uh, PhD or master degree in energy storage. They ask me what are there left to do. Uh, and in my mind, there are so many more problems that we have not resolved yet, even though that lithium ion batteries is a you know, $50 billion industry now. But in fact, we have a lot of unanswered challenges uh, to, to the public. For instance, a battery with very high energy density, but never catch fire. So right now, the accidents rate is one in 10 million. So we ship out about a billion cells of our industry. We still have, you know, accident here and there. So it's not good enough. We admit this, we need to do better. Um, the other thing is, you know, the solar cells now can last 30 years. I always get a requirement request from, uh, you know, uh, people who have the uh, installed the Tesla wall. They were like, how long that's going to last? I, when I tell them maybe only seven to 10 years, they were pretty upset because, you know, the solar cell, solar um, panels guarantee 20 years of lifetime, right? And then we also are seeing the huge demand in battery recycling. And I think in the United States, I think uh, people are very impatient going to the charging station. Uh, so 30 minutes is not good enough. They want to do fast charging. So all these topics, in my opinion, uh, for the young uh, researchers or new researchers, everybody is young, okay? If you want to change field, so you are young researchers. So for people who wants to come into this area, I think there's plenty of work to be done. Uh, because the electrification of our society is an unstoppable trend and we need to do better uh, in terms of safety and performance. So the allure for all solid state batteries is quite clear because uh, you know, I just show you a few like the videos, right? Like um, actually probably in this video is uh, more uh, clear, bigger, right? Just show you some tricks that you can play with solid state, all solid state battery. You can cut it. You can ban it, you can abuse it, and there's very low fire hazard. I won't say it completely will not have any safety accident, but you can never do this with the liquid cells, right? And you can also, uh, also uh, widen the temperature of operations that the batteries can operate at a pretty high temperature. So this is the, um, how we say, the consequences if you can actually enable uh, solid state uh, uh, batteries but the unknown question is pretty clear because um you know we improve the properties and nobody can guarantee at the moment that the cost is down right so the for the batteries we always talk about the cost to performance ratio so uh i would say we should never be driven by you know okay this is the next the best batteries instead all the people should actually really think about what interesting material science and electrochemistry I can do. Now I have a new platform with solid state electrolyte. So the difference between liquid and solid is that in the liquid electrolyte, I have intercalation materials like graphite and the, uh, um, like, um, you know, uh, traditional metal oxide. They are stable in the homo lumo level of the liquid electrolyte. Uh, when I cycle the cell, of course, there's SEI. Now, in the solid state, we have a big trouble because the anode is lithium metal. We want to enable lithium metal, right? And I just tell you, lithium metal reacts with everything. And that everything includes many of the polymers and the sulfides. Uh, lithium is indeed stable with LLZO, Garnet type of uh, castle, uh, sorry, solid electrolyte. But that's a very rare cases, right? So number one, material scientists have to think about how to make them chemically compatible to stabilize the lithium metal anode in the solid. Okay. Number two, of course, you have another uh, challenge. The solid usually has very narrow electrochemical windows, so you still have the SEI challenge. Number three, the more problem for solid is that in the liquid cell, the liquid can flow freely. When you, whenever you have something, the liquid will flow in. Now in the solid, if you have a, during the synthesis, you have a void, you have a empty space. That's not good during the synthesis because you have created a lot extra interface. So in this chemical review paper, we said you have at least six extra 
interfaces compared to the liquid uh, electrochemical cells because you have you know uh, the void can also be playing a very important role and for this reason in solid state batteries mechanical compatibility or mechanical properties become such important topics uh, beyond just electrochemical interface right so if it's a interface uh, stabilization I can apply many tricks like uh, co uh, coding materials and I can because 10 years experience in cathode coding I think we are quite comfortable to do the coding but this mechanical strength is something really really surprised me okay so um in terms of uh, 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 coding I want to say that you know the uh, coding, you know, like five to 10 nanometer conformal coding, the material scientists have many ways to achieve that. And indeed, with the sulfide based electrolyte and the, the nickel based the cathode, if you do not uh, engineer the interface, you cannot actually utilize the cathode very well and you cannot cycle the cell very well. And this particular coating here is a lithium niobate oxide which was released by Toyota many years ago, and they already have patents, uh, but doesn't matter. In fact, uh, scientists, my colleague, uh, Professor Xue Bing Ong, gave us a list of candidates we can try for our computation. We can actually compute what's compatible, what's not compatible. So indeed, the blue ones are very good. Actually, we found that the lithium borates are very compatible, and you can actually produce the similar results as the lithium uh, niobates. Now the unresolved issue is really the mechanical. Oh yeah, this is the data we released with LG uh, uh, Energy uh, Solution that uh, the boron coding can actually enable us to cycle the solid state batteries very very stable. Um, so mechanical strength is the unresolved challenge. So I'll show you a quick example how bad the situation is uh, during the uh, synthesis because everything is solid, right? But the problem is they are not same mechanical property. Lithium is soft, sulfide is not so soft, but still, you know, a little bit malleable. Oxides is very hard. So during the synthesis, you need to do a contact increase by increasing the pressure to 25 megapascal. That reduces the contact resistance dramatically. But during the cycling, if you don't release the stress or the, the, the release the stack pressure, you run into a problem called mechanical induced shorting of the lithium because the lithium will creep into the cracks in the solid state electrolyte. So when we find that it's to our surprise, the lithium metal anode only cycles when you release the pressure to five megapascal. But if you have complete pressure free, like if you don't add any pressure, you also cannot cycle the uh, cell. So we are only at the very beginning of lithium metal um, based solid state battery, because even though here, you know, in publication, I can show you this is a quite a stable cycling. The point here is to prove stability, but the performance, I mean, this rate, I mean, I'm moving the lithium ions 10 times slower than the liquid case. And that's how I move slowly. This whole experiment takes three months to complete, right? So the mechanical, uh, um, optimal mechanical uh, setup for the solid state battery is still a largely unresolved issue. Um, on top of that, I would say as someone who work on characterization, I am facing a lot of challenges because uh, these interfaces, because they are all solid state, so they are completely buried I, not only that, but these um, lithium containing materials are extremely sensitive to air, to nitrogen, to moisture. So the characterization become a very, very difficult task. I think uh, recent years, uh, CT, uh, FIB cutting, they become very important tools for us to look at these um, buried interfaces, uh, but it's pretty challenging, I would say. So if I have to give a quick like summary of what happened in the solid state battery field. I believe in terms of ionic conductivity, we have plenty of candidates, sulfides, oxides, halides, you know, just uh, two years ago, the halides reported the uh, record high conductivity numbers. Now our challenge for interfacial stability is being well addressed because we developed uh, quite a lot of advanced characterization method. 
Uh, in terms of mechanical stability, I will put a question mark here. And more importantly, because we are switching from liquid electrolyte to solid, how the processability and scalability look like is still a big question mark, right? So if I only need to focus on the positive side of the solid state battery is that, uh, you know, in the past, the room temperature sodium solid state batteries is not accessible. Today, with all the discovery of new halide based solid electrolyte, it is possible, this is a new phase reported earlier this year by my colleague uh, Shi Bing Ong and I, uh, we you know, made these uh, new uh, yitrin zirconia uh, chloride based halide sodium, room temperature sodium solid state batteries, uh, solid, solid state electrolyte that can enable quite uh, stable uh, solid state uh, uh, sodium ion batteries cycling, right? So uh, this is, of course, far, far away from commercialization because uh, we are only conducting in tiny little lab scale uh, cells. But the exciting things, again, is we, we find ways to discover new super ionic conductors and find ways to do better interfacial engineering. So uh, I think with that, uh, I would say, you know, uh, let me bring my talk uh, to a finish line. Uh, we have, I have been extremely blessed with brilliant students and the postdocs um, who contributed to uh, all the work I have talked about. And uh, we are very uh, blessed with the DOE, both, both basic science, because a lot of the characterization tools takes years to develop. Uh, as well as the vehicle technology offices uh, for the uh, cell prototyping and things uh, related to that. And uh, also our industry and national lab partners. Uh, um, I think uh, I will have time to take a couple of questions, I hope. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sheila. This is really uh, impressive work. Uh, I really like you have to really get to the bottom of the problem, the material science problem in order to better the design of the battery electrodes. Um, so any, first of all, any questions from the uh, participants in, in this room? Uh, you can unmute yourself and just uh, ask the question. Hi, Yuri, go ahead. Hi, Hi Shirley. Hello, this um, is Yuri. Very inspirational uh, talk. I'm wondering whether you think that uh, polymers or other faster systems than chalcogenides or oxides can be competitors for the solid electrolyte markets. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, let me, uh, you know, just uh, use this graph to explain uh, what is the status of the solid state uh, um, electrolytes. So um, I believe that the polymer will play an important role uh, in terms of addressing the mechanical stability and interfacial stability. Now, uh, if you look at this dotted line here, uh, that's the liquid LPF6 line. Mm -hmm. So a couple of our solid state electrolyte is only one magnitude away in conductivity uh, compared mm -hmm. to the uh, uh, liquid uh, electrolyte. Now, the difference is the transference number. So in solid state, the transference number is very high, but in the liquid, they are low. So for polymer, I think uh, uh, there, has, there are still debates if polymer is really single ion conductor with very high transference number. I hope uh, the patch is not listening, but uh, I mean, there's a debate. So to me at the moment, uh, even if polymer has very high ionic conduction, I need a high transference number because the problem mm -hmm. is if the anion is moving together with the lithium, you always have this uh, challenges for the mm -hmm. uh, uh, kinetics, like for the impedance of the cells. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's still an ongoing uh, 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 research topic. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, in order to make uh, thin flexible membranes for with these ceramic materials, polymer must play a role. So mm -hmm. whether it's lithium conducting polymer or non-conducting polymer, uh, mm -hmm. that's open for debate. But I think uh, polymer will definitely play a very important role in the uh, solid state batteries. Thank you. Great, so I have a, a question, a couple of questions from the other platform. The first one, uh, I'll go with the first one first. 
And so the question is regarding the castle materials. Um, what aspects of research might, might have more potential, like looking forward? Oh, yeah. What Thank you. A very good question. So I today I didn't have too much time to talk about the challenge for the cathode electrolyte interface. Okay, so uh, maybe I can use this picture to explain. Uh, if you look at this uh, bulk cell characterization, this is a pristine material. So the cathode, right, um, the challenge is really, you know, even for intercalation cathode, they have, they experience two to 4% of volume change. Okay, so if the volume change happens and those cathode detach because they are shrinking, right? So shrinking or expanding, if they detach from the solid electrolyte, then you lost contact. And because it's solid state, the electrolyte cannot flow and that will increase your cathode uh, electrolyte interface impedance. So this is actually, to me, the single most critical problems for the cathode and which is still not resolved. So uh, I think uh, uh, the, the, the person asked the question is really you know, an expert. So this is, a, this is an important area that all the people who are on the cathode side of the solid state batteries have to worry about. It's very, very difficult to find a low or zero volume expansion cathode uh, so far. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions from the zone room? Um, if not, there's another question uh, regarding the self-discharge performance in solid state or solid state batteries. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, at the moment, so I think uh, uh, the solid state batteries uh, field has not reached the maturity level of uh, doing proper calendar life assessment. So um, I think uh, uh, at the moment, uh, at least the lithium interface with the solid state is stable uh, under the, uh, um, I would say the current test conditions. But as we, I reviewed that everything is in very small scale uh, cells. So the area is very small, right? So I think until we can build a very large uh, pouch cells, uh, large area pouch cells, we can then do the proper measurement. But I do want to spend, uh, maybe take this opportunity to address this lithium metal, um, you know, this corrosion problem for the lithium metal, uh, in, even in liquid. Uh, I want to clarify, uh, if you have this kind of very densely packed lithium metal, uh, the corrosion problems or the self-discharge problems is very minimal because there's almost no contact except for the top surface, which already have all the SEI formed, uh, there's almost no direct contact with the uh, fresh uh, electrolyte. And we can actually, you know, um, keep those cells uh, functional and, uh, um, you know, low uh, self-discharge for months and months. And these kind of uh, cells has already been demonstrated in large format. So they have appropriate, proper evaluation of the self-discharge. Uh, so yeah, for solid state, uh, it's still a little bit early, but I think uh, in the end that this this question has to be addressed. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Uh, I think we'll, we'll maybe the last one here. Sure. Um, so what else is left to be started in the field? So conventional LFP and LCO, I'm sorry, I'm not in the field, so I don't know what those meant. That's very good. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you for the great questions, actually, the audience, I really appreciate it. Yeah, so for me, the LFP and the LCO, for me right now, fast charging. And it's, uh, I didn't have time today to address this topic. For me, this is really, you know, thermal, mechanical, electrochemical, like three coupled phenomena. And I think to push materials like the LCO and the LFP to the extreme is something very, very fun to do. So um, I believe that uh, uh, you know the future cell phone batteries will all be charged in five minutes if we can do this right. <laughs> yeah, even though you know I think uh, um, from the chemistry perspective maybe there's not a lot to be done, but from the thermal mechanical property perspective, uh, there's a lot more to be done uh, for the LFP and LCO. Great, thank you. And 